and we are live. Welcome back, everybody, to Behind the Tool Belt, episode 221. Today, we have another special guest. Stay tuned. We will be back after our short intro from our sponsors. My name is Ty Backer. The name of the podcast is called Behind a Tool Belt. Thank God this isn't live, or is it? You assholes go live. We might be here for a while, so buckle down. And we're back. Welcome back, everybody. Thanks for tuning in on your lunch break and adapting to our new 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It's actually 11 a.m. here in Dallas, Texas. We are currently attending the Windstorm event, uh, currently under new ownership by... Josie Parks and his team are doing a phenomenal job so far. Uh, today, we have a uh, magnificent, probably one of the heaviest hitters in his space, uh, Mike Claudio, host of the Big Stud Podcast, owner founder at Win Rate Consulting, author, father, husband, coined the phrase win fast, win often. Mike, my friend, how you doing, brother? This is always impressive, the level that you do things at. Like just everything just, I mean, I know it doesn't happen overnight. I know you've been doing this for a long time and, you know, as, as somebody's been doing content, you know, and podcasting for a while, it's impressive to see how the, how much the details matter to you guys. And it's just uh props, man. It's not easy to do. People think it's easy. Look at like, Oh, it's just easy. It's just like tie back. It's just easy. It just does it. No, I'm like, I, I released like my 500th podcast episode last week and that ain't easy. And like seeing other people doing it at a really high level is just, I, I love watching people do really cool things at a really high level. So you should be proud of me. Thank, Thank you so much. Yeah. You know, it, it's not, it's not as easy as we might make it look and, and uh, sometimes very nerve wracking. We just got off the plane literally uh, within hours ago from Utah. We were at an event, uh, Diego Dante and, and Hunter Blue and, and their team uh, rode to RoofCon. So we didn't really set much up, but Vic was chasing me around with a camera. I had the opportunity to to speak there and uh, crushed it. I had prayed uh, in the morning that, you know, I just, as long as I can impact one person here, that, that they can go back to their family and, uh, you know, their company and then impact the the lives of those that, that work for them. And it's, it's going to be a win. And I was kind of nervous doing it, believe it or not. Everyone never believes me. Nobody ever believes me when I tell them that, you know, I, I get nervous. You know, I still have a lot of passion for this and, and I want to make sure I articulate the message well and and that that uh, they understand where I'm coming from and, and where I've been and how sincere I am about this. And and I had never done and I know this might sound crazy, but I've never done a PowerPoint presentation. And uh, so I was, I was a little nervous about that. And, and I had about three, maybe four days to prepare for this. I didn't know we were going. And uh, so I did it, threw it together. John helped me with it. We did uh, a Canva slide and it was, it was super dope. And uh, so of course I'm nervous and I can't see it. So I don't even remember which slide was next, but anyhow, so I kicked, kicked the crap out of myself thinking I didn't do very well. And I was stuttering a little bit. And, and uh, but I tell you what, there was a Q and a afterwards and there was probably five to 10 contractors that came up to me and just asked me, so many great questions and I I felt so fulfilled. And then even after the Q and a about five, six more contractors came up to me and uh, spoke to them. I I poured my heart out into them and uh, was still beating myself up a little bit. But then I started to realize, I was like, you know, we 10 X the mission, my mission. First thing in the morning when I prayed, I said, you know what? I just want to impact one person. And we impacted at least at least 15 people. But going back to what you were saying before I went down that rabbit hole a little bit was, you know, it's it's not easy. I'm my own worst critic. And, it, and this isn't I removed it being about me a long time ago. This is about, you know, Mike coming on the show and then everyone else listening. Um, and it's, this is about everybody else. And I don't really care or get hemmed up too much on how many ends, ums, ahs, F-bombs. 
all that stuff. I just really want to get the message out there. I want to impact somebody's life. And this is how we do it as nerve wracking as it is for us to set up a smash lab here quick in the, in the lobby as, as the union setting up back in the expo, they didn't let us in there yet. And uh, they're putting carpet down and curtains and all that stuff. It's, it's not easy, but th- we, there's a purpose. There's a why to it. This is our why. This is my why, not just my family. Um, yes. Number one, first and foremost, they're everything. Um, but, but secondarily, you know, the impact is just like you are, Mike. I know that's why you do this. Um, what you do for a living is that impact, that fulfillment that you feel after impacting somebody's life. It'd be hard. It'd be hard to keep up with it all if it wasn't worth it. You know, and like seeing people's lives change and families changed and, you know, breaking addictions, breaking the mental, the mental demons that a lot of people deal with. Like it's, it's people look at so much at these events and I think in the industry, I think all business, but I think contractors show with a lot of people, they just focus on top line revenue as the only measurement tool. Right. And it's like, it's so not the right measurement tool in the grand scheme of things. Like I've coached hundreds of companies now and like, the ones you think that got the most together are likely the most broken behind the scenes. You just found a way to outwork the problems, right? Like, and, and so like the top line revenue is, is not where winning really happens. And if you look at it from the, the grand scheme of life, you know, I look at a lot of different factors and I try to determine what winning looks like to me. My, like my talk at RoofCon last year, my keynote speech at RoofCon last year was around like dreaming selfishly and figuring out like who you want to be and how you want to operate. Because when you're chasing a single scoreboard like that, you drop the ball on so many other avenues and so many other aspects of life and business, you know, and, you know, from that perspective, it's one of those things where it's money is not the ultimate goal. And you don't, you don't know that. So you get it. You know, it's it's the only thing you worry about when you don't have it and you get it and you realize, well, that didn't actually do anything for me. Mm Mm-hmm. And like, that's, I think that's the hardest part to like help people understand when they're behind the, when they're behind the, the ball of, of payroll and mortgage and they don't have the house they want or the car they want or the employees they want or the companies they want or the vehicle, like all these things, money, money, money. Mm-hmm. Then you lose yeah. yourself on the journey. Like, I mean, you and I've talked about it, you know, you lose mm-hmm. yourself on that journey and then you have to like, and at some point you have to break something to rebuild. And I try really hard as a coach to help people not have to like build something. They have to completely break apart to rebuild later because that is always more painful. You always let people down. You always cost you more money. And I, like you're doing it in the impact you're making and helping people shorten that failure gap. So they don't have to end up like, you know, breaking something in the future. And sometimes, you know, something I heard somebody say once is when building a business at some point, you're going to go bankrupt somehow. Bankrupt isn't only in money. Like you go bankrupt emotionally, you go bankrupt spiritually, you go bankrupt in emotions, you go or, uh, relationships, you go bankrupt physically. Like you lose everything in some aspect if you're not careful and paying attention to the whole picture. You know, money is the bankruptcy that most people talk about, but like people lose relationships, marriages, relationship with their kids. Their health and fitness is typically one of the ones that goes pretty quickly as well. You know, people get bankrupt in those avenues. Self confidence gets bankrupt. But they're like, oh, but I got a $10 million company. Cool. But like, you also hate going home. Like, that's not a win. You know, it's, it's like, what does winning look like to you is a really big part of, you know, the impact you're making and the impact that I try to make. No doubt. That's such a great topic. You touched on so many good points there. You know, self-esteem, confidence, oh, bankruptcy. You know, bankruptcy is not just a monetary or, or financial bankruptcy there's many other bankruptcies spiritual bankruptcies there's emotional bankruptcies there's Mm -hmm. bottoms right there's emotional spiritual bottoms that that i think a lot of people have have hit or or in right at this moment right but don't really want to talk about it that much and and that's why this is such a great topic right now um you know uh, about those things and how we pull ourselves out of that. And, and, you know, when things do break, like, how do we fix it? How do we respond? You know, what was our reaction to, to that? And that's, you know, why what you do is so important, uh, you know, for someone like me to, to be vulnerable and whether you know this or not, and I wanted to touch on this, like whether you know it or not, Mike, you've been a mentor of mine from, from a distance, you know, I listened to your podcast and, and stuff like that, read your book, I don't even know what it was like three, four years ago. You came out with a book. Um, mm-hmm. I read, I read that 
Um, so you've been, you've played a big, huge part, um, you know, of, of my success, you know, and that's, what's cool about what we do. Right. So people can, can listen to our experiences, the, the vulnerabilities, the, the trials and tribulations that we've gone through. And, and I think once you get, you know, getting back to like, we don't get paid to do this. I don't get paid to be a podcaster. We don't get paid. To <laughs> it costs a lot of money to be a podcaster, man. Like, yes. Yeah, <laughs> it really is. It's, it's, it's become, you know, what, what has happened though is the money has become like the tool has become the vehicle. So we could actually do these things. And, and it definitely at times don't make financial sense to pack the gear up and, and come to win the storm. And it's not even an ego thing because I had to check that, you know, like, why are we doing this? Like last year we went to every single event um, and to, to, see if we could do it you know first and foremost it was kind of maybe a pride thing maybe not necessarily an ego thing and and then we've realized the impact that we had this year people are asking us to come back this year because of the impact that we had i'm getting more speaking engagements um people are asking us to come back and talk and uh you know the, the purpose of things i apologize about the noise like i said we're kind of, kind of in the lobby of a hotel yeah, but let me, let me ask you a question. So I think a lot of people struggle with this and I think a lot of people have a lot of value to bring, but they deal with the insecurities and like the personal doubts and the imposter syndrome. And was there a moment or a season for you? This is my podcast. But I'm curious. I think it's a topic we can talk about when like you realize like, oh, I actually do have value to bring people. And I, I need to start sharing that because like you've been in business for a really long time, mm-hmm. decades, right? Yeah. You know, and I've been in, I've been in the world of construction for the, you know, since pretty much 2012. So going over a decade, um, you know, it's like, it was there a moment when you were like, I've learned enough lessons now that like people need to hear this, or I, I, I should impact people or I, I'm able to impact people. Cause then there's people, someone's going to listen to this. Just like you read my book. Someone's gonna be like, I actually do have an impact I can make. Right. And like you and I can't impact everybody. Like that's like the whole coaching world. They're all trying to, they're all fighting over the same people. I'm, I'm abundance. There's so many people out there need to be helped. I want to actually create more influencers in this space that are doing it right. So how yeah. did you, was there a moment? Was there a season when you're like, Oh, I actually can help people. You know, that's a great question because, <clears throat> because I have suffered from insecurity and doubt and, and stuff like that. And I, I I've come from a, a broken past, which was self induced, self inflicted, um, so that the insecurity was there from the beginning. Like if you really knew who I was, you wouldn't want nothing to do with me kind of imposter syndrome. And, and I struggled with that, but, but I think that has also helped me push me to make sure that, you know, like when you said earlier, like we pay attention to every detail, that's why that because yeah. due to my insecurity, um, <laughs> you know, of failure, it's a that, curse, huh? yeah, we, we have yeah. to push ourselves double time and, and to be able to surround myself around people who, co-sign that with me i guess for lack of better terms uh vic is one of my biggest um fans uh who the man behind the lens he would fall on a sword for me because he believes in the in in the purpose but i would say probably going back probably close to to nine 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 and a half ten years ago my mom had lived with us and she had passed away and she was, she was huge in, in giving. She was a huge servant, um, did everything for the community on many different levels, summer Jubilees, uh, exchange club, uh, Santa's breakfasts, <clears throat> the dare program she brought to my school back when I was in elementary school. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, so when she passed, um, I felt like I, I, I needed to fill her shoes, right. I needed to pick the torch up and that's kind of how I dealt with that grieving as well instead of like letting it manifest into like a negative in my life and and fall back into the bottle and things like that i kind of went on this journey but i really didn't know where i was going so about five years ago five six years ago i read the book leaders eat last by simon sinek and that for me had really opened my eyes and and solidified and crystallized for me like like actually like like what my purpose was, what my mission is going to be. It's like, I needed to read that book. It was, and it was such a good, and then I read, I actually read it backwards. I should have started with why start with why, but I read leaders eat last. Then I read start with why and, and how he articulated what his purpose was, what his why was like leading, leading from behind, um, 
and and showing the love to your team and giving them the credit when credit's due and, and even sometimes when it's not due and empowering them, encouraging them. I went on a mission and and I started to retain, uh, attract people in, in our business and those that the quality of people, it seemed like that started to come into my life when my mindset shifted like when that paradigm shift happened for me after reading that book and I read it several times, I, it's one of those books I read at least once a year. And, uh, so then, um, it was probably about four, four to six years ago, I read that. And then I started to, um, uh, dive into other literature and podcast and, and things like that. And, and I started to gain confidence because I realized that my mess actually became my message. Mm. Okay. And I think I was able to inspire a lot of people, whether it was in recovery, people that I worked with, um, we attracted a lot of people in recovery to come work for us. Um, we all believe kind of our, our core values, our personal core values, our, our, our professional core values all align very well. And, and I still, I still struggle with doubt. That's, that's why I have a coach today. I have a sponsor, um, um, that, that I bounce ideas off of because, you know, I, I, I have a hundred ideas that I think are great ideas, but only usually one of them are, are a good idea at the time. But, it, you know, I, I think probably four years ago, I really started, <clears throat> and I know it sounds crazy that it's only been like four years and some people might be like, wow, that's a long time. But for me, it just seemed like it was yesterday where it was like, I started to come out of my shell. I started to come out of the shadows and was like, Hey, you know, I, my mess is now my message. I feel like I can really help you. And I've, I've always helped people. I bet I'm, for those of you that might not know, I've been in recovery for, for over a decade and a half. And, um, so I've always had that, you know, I got to give this thing a way to keep it mentality. That's, that's one of, you know, my personal core values that if I want to keep this thing, I, I have to give away, you know, every single nugget that's ever been given to me so freely, you know, and I have to give it away as freely as it was given to me. No, that makes sense. I mean, that's a, that's a powerful reason. And obviously a long journey of messes to turn into a pretty powerful message, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, if you look at it from that perspective, it, uh, you know, built up momentum over a long period of time. Yeah. But I think more people need to appreciate those mistakes. You know, I think they look at them as this, this badge of failure, as opposed to a badge of honor. You know, I, I talk to people a lot of say, you know, I think you, you did this, uh, but I think a lot of people struggle with this. It's like, you got to, coach from the from the scars not the wounds that's a that's a, a lesson i i heard once i heard someone say once is like coach and mentor from your scars not your wounds you know when you were in the start you know the starting battle of recovery it was not the right time to start talking about recovery you were still a wound right mm -hmm. but now these messes aka I, I would call those scars are great hey look you know how i did that it was right here look you see this right here you see that you see that that, that scar don't do that okay like this is what happened when you do that and like, it, because it's healed, you've emotionally disconnected from the wound and makes it easier to talk about it. And so, you know, that, that's one of the best, I would say, depictions of, of how to and what to coach or mentor on, you know, is like, you know, teach from scars, not from wounds, mm -hmm. you know, and it, it yeah. helps people yeah. relate to it and it helps people like see that you've been through the battles and can really make a bigger impact if people like they have the empathy to say, you get it because you have that scar. I see it. I can, I can visualize it and it's, it can be really powerful for people. For sure. For sure. You know, and, and, and that's funny you say that because, you know, I needed that experience. I needed to make those mistakes. And we talk about things like this all the time. It's called experience. I needed to make all of those mistakes. Um, in order to be who I am today, I needed to pick up every single drink. I needed to do every single drug. I needed to do all of those things. And thank God it wasn't horribly grimy stuff. I mean, I drank a lot. I partied a lot. And I realized that I was allergic to alcohol because every time I drank, I broke out in handcuffs. Right. So I, ah, yeah. ah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, I'm sure you've said that a hundred times, but I've never heard that. I'm, yeah. I'm, that's good. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and, you know, along the way, and thank God I didn't burn myself out too bad where, you know, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm still relatively intelligent and sharp and, and, uh, you know, I, I can retain and, you know, uh, become very knowledgeable at things that I'm very passionate at. Right. And, and I've become a, a pretty good business owner as well. So I've applied those things that I've, I've learned, you know, from, from my personal life, I apply them into my business life. And that's, I think that's where a lot of my humility 
has come from because I don't forget where I come from, Bum. And I, I think that's some of the two two things here. I think some some of the issue that we have, especially in this space, whether it's you know the the whole guru thing, is the lack of experience um, that a lot of people that are coming into this space and, and nothing wrong with that. I mean, you got to start somewhere, right. To, to gain that knowledge. But I don't think necessarily they have the, the experience from having a broken background or have been seasoned enough or have gone through enough seasons in their, in their lifetime to speak intelligently, whether it's uh, financially business or, or on personal development stuff like that because i see a lot of that and i think that's that might have been one of the driving forces for me as well too it's like what good is it if i die with it all up here what good is it doing to anyone else and i try to share that message within our organizations you know especially with the older guys that are coming through on the production side of things that that don't necessarily know how to coach because they're from the old school mentality but it's like listen denny if you died today you know, what good would it be to the, the five youngsters that, that are under your management? You know, if you're not, you know, articulating how you do things to the best of your ability to them, because this is the thing we have to continuously, especially in, in a management position. I remember early on in my career, I wore 75 different hats. We talked about this earlier mm-hmm. this morning with uh, some of our team came down here with us today, some of our leadership team. And I love when we get together because we just kind of nerd out on, on leadership. Like leadership is, is my, is my bag, man. I just, I love it. Um, I'm, I'm going to be continuously a student of, of leadership. Um, and in, hopefully in that um, I can become a pretty good steward as well of leadership. But anyhow, we were talking about, you know, insecurity, this whole, this topic, it's almost like you were sitting in a room with us, Mike. Um, <clears throat> but, um, you know, I, I, I lost my train of thought there for a second. Sorry. There's a lot going on here. Where the hell was I going with that? Leadership. Leadership yeah. Um, but I was talking to Mike T who was with us this morning and, uh, we were talking about leadership and we were talking about, and I'm going to probably totally go off track here a little because I totally forgot what the hell I was talking about. Um, that might be the three hour time differences, time zones that we've been in <laughs> yeah, over the past probably. 36 hours. Um, oh, and I'm not exaggerating from East coast to Utah to Texas now, plus the spring ahead time change thing. Here's got my throat and <clears throat> the elevations and stuff of Utah and everything wonky with me anyhow. But, um, you know, I, we, we were talking about insecurity and, and being able to delegate responsibilities. You know, I was wearing the 75 hats and, and I, and I was, I was just holding on so tightly because I felt like nobody could do my job as good as I could mm-hmm. do it. And, um, a lot of that had to do with insecurity about myself. And, and the reason why I say that is because I don't think I had an issue with delegating stuff, but my issue was, is that I would take it back. I would take the win out of their sales. Right. I'd be like, here, do this for me. But then I would watch exactly how they did it. Nope. You did it wrong. Nope. Get out of the way. I'm going to do it. And a lot of that had to do with my self-esteem, my insecurity. And, and, and I wasn't being a very good leader. I thought I was, you know what I mean? Cause we were getting shit done and, and, and I talked down to you to make myself feel better because I was insecure about my abilities, my inabilities. Um, so I find today that the more, that I've worked on myself and the more that I'm okay with myself, the easier it is for me to trust another individual because one, I trust myself, right? I I'm, I'm not so insecure. I feel like I should be in this room today uh, because there was a long, there was for, for the longest time going back to what we were, the original conversation here was, is that I didn't feel like I deserved or earned my right to be in the same room with Mike Claudio on the podcast today. You know, that would have been my fear that would have held me back from growth personally. And it would have held the company back from growing as well, because I kept bottlenecking the business, but until I got okay with me and got right, right with me, the six inches between my ears, that's what was broken. Not everything else as I'm screaming, go, 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 grow, grow, grow. And wondering why we're not going anywhere. I had three fingers pointing pointing back at me and I use that analogy probably five times today. Is this something I've created? Yeah. Well, I think, I, mean? I think one of the issues is like we were talking, well, I think where the conversation where you lost Trevor, we were talking about like gurus and coaches getting into the industry and like not really okay. having the experience of every word, yeah. but you know, whether it's in a, in a coaching environment or a leadership role, I think where a lot of people fail is they're very uncomfortable with what they don't know. 
And so you have to go in, it's like you almost pretend or force it because you don't want anybody to think that you don't know something. And I think that's when, like, you know, if you look at coaches or mentors, if they really start to mess up when they try to coach out, like they kind of outpunt their coverage a little bit. You know, they're at a three and they're trying to coach someone at a nine, and like that just doesn't work. But that person, if you're at a three, one and two need your help to get to where you're at, right? And so, but I think that happens in business too, where leaders, CEOs are maybe a three in a category and they hire a seven and then try to force them to do everything that, that the three knows. And they basically turn the seven into a four because they don't just, they can't just say, I don't know. You're smarter than me. You tell me what this is supposed to look like and then go do it. And that, that ability to separate from the the emotion of what you might not know and like, oh, a CEO is supposed to know everything. No, they're not. Like Steve Jobs does not know how to build an iPhone, right? Like he did not know how to do that. He had very good skill sets, right? And so but you see this all the time in small business, especially when like you were the technician that started it, is you hire people that are better than you and then pull them down to your level because you don't want to give up control of certain things. And it, all it came down to was the intentionality of, I don't know this. I hired you to know this. If you don't know this, I got to hire somebody else. Like I've had that conversation with people. I don't know how to do this. Stop asking me. I hired you to do this. And if you don't know how to do this, then I need to hire somebody else. Mm-hmm. And they'll be like, no, 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 I know. I just didn't know how you wanted it done. I don't know how to do this. So how I want it done is irrelevant. It's it's under, you know, I'll underperform your level of doing whatever that thing is, right? You know, for me, it was, it was learning PNL and balance sheets. Like I was not good at that. I hired people to teach me that. And now I'm better. I'm still not the expert, but I'm better. I think so many leaders get stuck in the, well, how do you want this done, boss? And they're like, well, then they tell them, but it's at a, it's at a three level when that person was capable of a seven. And that's where businesses stagnate. It's where growth halts. It's where great employees turn into terrible employees they feel stagnated in their role and like that's something you evolve through obviously and are now better at pointing all five fingers at everybody else mm-hmm. but like but overall i think it's that it's the it's the ego and the insecurity that you feel like you're supposed to know everything the minute you can accept you're not supposed to know everything everything in life gets better because you can walk into any room and get on any stage you get on any podcast like i don't know and like that's okay. Like I, I like to you. You said earlier in, in this conversation, I'm like you. You don't like using PowerPoint presentations. I don't either. Um, I've started using them more lately because of the. I'm trying to build more of a consistent keynote speech, kind of that you know. So like using a like a, a presentation helps. But from the standpoint of like, I'm not afraid to get on stage, like, and say something, and someone go, "I think you're wrong," and I go, "Yeah, why?" They say this reason. I said, I actually agree with you. I am wrong. Thank you so much. And move on like nothing fucking happened. Mm-hmm. And so many people just do not have the ability to do that inside their own companies. And that that stagnates so much growth and so much opportunity. And like that same person's complaining three years later, dude, no one just wants to work anymore, man. I can't find anybody who wants to do any work around here. No, they just didn't want to do it your shitty way. And you didn't give them permission to be creative and build it their own way. And like, that's just a fact 100%. that most people struggle with in this, what I would consider small to medium business world. You don't get to large business holding on to everything. So like you, yeah. you, you even get like, I don't, I don't know what you consider a medium business, but I'd say like 25 million to like 500 million is probably a medium business. I don't know. I don't know. If the, I'm sure there's a metric out there. I don't know what it actually is, mm-hmm. but like under 25 million is a small company. You know, and so in that space, you can own more than you have to, to be there. Beyond that, you have to learn how to give up control and you have to learn how to like be okay being bored sometimes and not jump into the business and just create problems. So you have something to solve. Like those are major issues I see in small businesses when like that leader is struggling with that evolution to CEO. hundred percent. 100%. 100%. I agree, I agree with everything that you're saying because I unfortunately I hate to say this but I I lived that nightmare, mm-hmm. you know, uh of of that fear and that insecurity and you know as as a as a entrepreneur or a CEO whatever whatever title you want to use, right? Like our job is is to inspire and motivate 
and, and, and create good ideas and, and then be smart enough to know that you need to surround yourself around smarter people and that your job, I actually recently changed my, my signature. Right. And I, I've been talking a lot about this, but I just recently read a book by John Gordon. It's called the energy bus. And I can't speak highly enough about it. Um, he talks about, you know, CEOs and, and what his terminology of a CEO was a chief energy officer. Great book. So I recently changed my signature to say that I'm the, the CEO and I put underneath CEO chief energy officer because I'm the one that needs to bring the, the energy. I'm the one that needs to, to bring the positivity. I'm the one that needs to bring, you know, that good creative momentum and keep that momentum. And once you find that momentum and see, that's probably the hard part. Like those that are stuck in that, I need to know everything and, and filled with fear because they know that they don't know everything. Okay. It's okay to say that I don't know anything and that, um, you know, I need help with this or, or ask questions and empower your team to, to collectively think on how to build something out, whether it's a system, a process or a project that, that you guys are working on together. I think that sense of ownership that, that you can give to your team, but how you articulate that I don't understand this, but I, w- I need your help with it also matters too. Um, when, when you're talking, but, but, there's two words that, that I've learned over the years that, that has been probably two of the most powerful words that, that I've ever used was you decide, you decide. And what's cool about it is if you can get your business to, to a place where you're not the one just making all of the decisions anymore, that you've empowered your team, you've entrusted your team enough to make daily decisions. Right. And, and of course you got to practice. This is definitely something that I've had to practice at and choosing the right people that can make those decisions. But when I started to find my replacements, not because I'm trying to retire, but on a micro level, you know, my replacements for, you know, the marketing, the AR, the, the, you know, the, 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 the invoicing, the, the service department, the costing department. So I found all these replacements for me. Right. And what's crazy is, is that I was, I was so mediocre at, at everything anyhow, because I was spread so thin. But when I started to find my replacements and empower my team, you know, now they have ownership in it. They're doing it so much better than I could possibly have ever done it. And it's because I was okay with me knowing that my limitation is this. These people can see around corners that I can't see around. And I need them to to take on that responsibility and carry this load with me, carry that burden, you know, and have ownership in this thing. Because when they grow, the company grows. You know what I mean? I think when we think so short-sightedly, you know, we paralyze the company like you were talking about, Mike. We hold the company back. We hold our people back. We drag them down. We hire all these eights and nines and tens. And here we are four because we decided to stay in the weeds, work on the business, stop working on ourselves, or maybe we never even worked on ourselves to become an eight, right? In our leadership. If there if there was a skill from one to ten, you know, you need to be at least an eight. If you're going to be in a leadership position, you need to be on an eight because if you can, the more that you work on yourself and, and the more that you can learn to leverage your assets, which is your people, your people are your assets. And if you can get out of the business, start working on yourself, start learning how to dedicate delegate and empower and entrust people to do the job and work in the company while, you know, while you're working on, you know, at a higher level, like kind of so you can see everything, dude, that's where the exponential growth comes in for them because as they grow, the business grows. And I don't think a lot of people see it that way. And I, I think it's due to insecurity. I think it's, it's due to insecurity. I think they overvalue getting it wrong. Like they're so afraid, like if they hire somebody and it's the wrong hire, they train them and it's not like they're so afraid of it getting it wrong that they stagnate in any decision. Like you got to hire slow and fire fast. Like I've always mm-hmm. said that, you know, like there's a, there's a joke that goes around the winter ecosystem because people ask me about a problem with an employee. It's always almost fire them. Like it's, if, you, if you're bringing it to my attention, it's already too late. Like it's the problem has been going on for probably a long time that you don't even know about. And so mm-hmm. we talk about fire fast went off and like when fast went off and is the tagline, but fire fast went off and it's kind of a joke that goes around. But I think people do this. They hear us talking about it and think that like, the first time they hire somebody, that's going to be the guy and give up full control to that person. That is not what we're saying. Mm-mm. Like 
but there, there's 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 that dichotomy of like how much per- permissions or how much control to give up, how much to keep, and I think that stagnates people because like you're gonna get it wrong. Like you have, you got to do what we just talked about. You have to be really good at recruiting. You have to be really good at hiring. You have to be really good at onboarding. You have to be really good at leadership. You have to be really good at accountability. You have to have objective measurement tools like KPIs and, and SOPs in order to hold people accountable. All that's that's the basic foundation necessary things to do what we just said. We made it sound simple. Yeah, hire people and then let them do stuff for you. That's not that's not the whole story, right? Like there's a lot more that goes into that that you and I learned over time of getting it wrong. But no matter what you do, those first couple of hires you're gonna mess up. You but in but the first couple of hires you're gonna mess up. No matter how long you plan, prepare, organize, you have to go through those lessons to learn what to look for and how to hire and your leadership style and your skill sets. And the longer you wait, like I would hire and fire 10 people between now and the end of the year just to learn how to. Because like that's part of business, man. Like if you're afraid of hiring and firing people, you're stuck. You're just an employee. Like you're a highly paid employee for the rest of your life. I would challenge everybody to try to hire and fire five people, five to 10 people by the end of the year. You will learn a lot in that process. Absolutely. And it, it doesn't like people look at, well, I don't want to hire someone for $80,000. and it not work out. Well, you're not really paying them $80,000. You're, you're giving them like, you know, two to three months to test it out. It's costing you like maybe 12 grand to test it. You lose, most people lose 12 grand. They don't even know it mm-hmm. on stupid mistakes. So from this leadership, the conversation that we, you know, obviously delved into today, like get really good at hiring and firing people by hiring and firing people. Like there's no other way to do it. Hundred percent, hundred percent. I I agree with you, one hundred percent on on hiring slow. Whether it's the the interviewing process to make sure that they fit the culture, you know, and that's that's the deal right there. You can have the best, most expensive systems processes put in place. Uh, KPIs, none of that matters if your culture is is garbage, okay? Because they're not going to follow the systems, they're not going to follow the processes, they're not they're not going to they're just not going to do it if 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 your culture sucks, right? And I learned that early on because we didn't even have a system in the process. The system in the process we did, and it was it was by default. The system and process was here every day as they were sitting outside my office door waiting for me to tell them what to do. And not necessarily, and unfortunately, I trained them that way. I trained them yeah. to wait for for me to go out there and tell them what to do. I trained them on 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 you know, I think you know what to think, not necessarily how to think on their own and make their own decisions throughout the course of the day. And of course, I wanted a bitch like, why do you continuously keep knocking on my door? Leave me alone, mm-hmm. right? And and but not that the culture was crap, but that's just the culture that I had developed. And, and when we talk about culture, the culture isn't, you know, the, the huggy grab assy, you know, take advantage of, because that's eventually that's what happens because I've been on that end of the spectrum too, where I didn't want to, you know, hurt anybody's feelings. And, you know, I want everybody to work hard for me. And so I'm not, I'm not going to hold them accountable. I'm not going to put KPIs and in place and things like that. We don't need it. We shouldn't have that, you know, and, and what happens is people end up taking advantage of you when, when you do that. And, you know, nobody likes the word accountability, right? Accountability equals success. My terminology of accountability means success. If we're not holding each other accountable, and again, I'm I'm pointing three fingers back at me too. You need to hold me accountable too. If I told you something that we were going to do something or this was the direction that we're going, right? You need to hold me accountable too. So I I need to lead by example. If I'm not the first one there and the last one to leave, and I and I did that for years. We set the precedence. I'm not getting there any earlier than my team is today. I've just now I think the I think the earliest somebody gets to the office is like 430. But that was the that was the the type of of culture, the mentality, the the standard that we set. The standard is what the standard is. And when people come in, right? So we we hire them slow. And if and when they're there for a while, we either they either level up or they get pushed out almost automatically. And it's like one of the first questions people ask me when they start is like, so, so when's the start time? And it's kind of like, you'll figure it out. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll be here at seven o'clock. Okay. Well, they'll get there at 7am. They'll realize people have already been there for two hours. 
So the next thing you know, the next morning you see them, they come in there, they're there at least a half hour earlier. And, and what happens is when you develop a culture like that, everyone is there for each other. They're so good that the person sitting next to them has a job today. That individual is so good at their job that that the person sitting next to them or the person across the hallway or the person upstairs in, in, in the conference room upstairs, they have a job today. So they, they have accountability for each other. And if I show up late today, it's not the anxiety that they're going to get scolded. It's the anxiety that they're letting their teammates down because they can't complete their job until I have my job completed. Mm-hmm. And, and when you can get and, and form that kind of culture, right? Then, then you, you grab the team, you get in a room and it's like, okay, well, we need a system and a process over here. We need KPIs put in over here. And when you can get them to build it together, now they got ownership. So when the new person comes in and they're training them, the new system or the, the old system or whatever that is, the KPIs and everything that's put into place, well, now they have ownership in it because they build it. They're the ones training the new guy or gal that comes into the organization and they have ownership in it. Like, this is something that we came up with. This this wasn't how it has always been, but this is the way that we do it now. This is what we've developed. And this is the thing about systems. It, it's a living, breathing organism. It needs its haircut. Sometimes you got to cl- clip its fingernails. Sometimes you you, you got to scrap it and, and start all over because what worked last year is not going to work this year. What worked last week isn't going to work this week probably. But without having systems and processes and KPIs put in place. You don't know if it's a personnel issue, if you don't, you won't know if it's a system issue. Okay. Without, without having that in place, does the system need tweak? Does it need revamp? Is it an incompetency thing? Is it a lack of training thing? What is it? But without a system and process put in place, you can't identify where things went wrong. People underestimate how valuable data is. Right. You know, it's one of one of the, I heard something once and it was the best thing you can have in any decision is clarity of the reality. Like people get wow. so overwhelmed by like the what ifs and the what might and the lack of details and like the what's really happening and not opinions and not emotions. It's like the best thing you can have in a decision is the clarity of the reality. Like that's why I do like as a coach is like help because I'm not emotionally attached to my clients' businesses. Like I am, but I'm not. It's not my baby, right? So like, hey man, like the reality is if you don't fire this person, this is what's going to happen. The reality is if you don't hire this person, this is what's going to happen. The reality is if you don't like it's I can bring reality because I'm not emotionally attached to the lack of details and or the the backlog of of context or anything else. And I think systems, processes, KPIs, data. Gives you the reality because I think that actually, you know, when someone's underperforming, right? Like it, it, it can be somewhat obvious, but what happens, I mean, a lot of times is people's overperformance or high energy or good personality can shield you from the reality of their underperformance. Like a bad attitude is easy to spot, mm-hmm. right? A bad attitude is easy to spot, but a good attitude that still sucks is still very detrimental to the mission. And that's the hard one. That's where the objective data, because then it's not me versus you. It's not Mike's opinion versus Ty's opinion. It's Ty, your performance to this objective standard that we agreed upon. We can both agree you're underperforming that standard. Not I think and your opinion is, and let's argue about perspective. It's the data shows you're underperforming the objective standard. I want to help you get there. It's me and you versus the standard, not me versus you, not my opinion and limited perspective to your opinion and full perspective, right? Because the first thing you do when you tell someone with a good, with a good, a good personality that they're underperforming, they want to just describe to you everything they think you don't know about how hard they've been trying. It doesn't matter how hard they're trying. It, uh, and that, I hate to say that, but the reality is it matters how well they're living up to the standard of that role in the overall machine. And without documented SOPs and standards and KPIs, it is literally just your opinion versus theirs. And because they're a good person, you won't hold them accountable. You'll believe their excuses. You'll believe their reasons. You'll give in to their perspective because they're good people and they try really hard. They've been around for a while. That's why that that objective, what I call third-party measurement tool, which is the SOP, which is the process, which is the KPI or the data or the activity or the CRM, 
that is what you need as a leader to hold people accountable. Without that, it's impossible. I believe it's impossible to hold an entire ship together with subjective standards. Objective standards, I believe, is the tool most leaders are missing when it comes to holding everybody in their ship to, to the standard. Because someone with high revenue numbers on the sales team is going to get away with stuff someone with low revenue numbers isn't. That's still unacceptable to me. Because the lack of activity or standard setting in this part for that high performer right now will turn them into a bad performer later. Like, what happened to that guy? He was closing millions of dollars last year. Well, he wasn't doing the work. He had, like, two referral partners that fed him, like, guaranteed closed deals all year. He pissed one of them off because he didn't follow the process, and now he's underperforming. Like, I don't know what happened. I know what happened. That shit triggers the shit every time. (laughs) I love it. (laughs) <laughs> that's so good it's so good everything that you're touching mike you are so smart you're one of the probably smartest people because i like i said i listen to you all the time and uh just the stuff that you come up with is, is just on such a, a deeper level um obviously uh, you have a lot of experience with with dealing with entrepreneurs and, and staffing issues and and things like that and and uh you know the confidence that that you have you know in your abilities um, you know, I think is a huge reflection on your success. There, there's no doubt about it. And why you run such a tight ship over there is, is because of the KPIs and, and the, the systems and processes that, that you put in place. Um, but uh, I, it, it, it's inspiring to me to, to listen to you. And, and I just, I listened to, um, uh, what was it your, your Monday, Monday morning, motivated, moti- motivated. Yeah. Mike's, um, Mike's Monday motivation. Yes. Yes. And that, I, I love that because, and it's, and it's a good, cause Mondays usually suck, I think. And I don't know why I still <laughs> think that at times, um, yeah. it's no different than a Sunday or a Friday. Um, but the, but to listen to that, but I think your last one was, um, uh, you must piss, uh, you must you, piss you, people you, you, off. You have to piss, you're going to have to piss some people off. Yeah. Yeah. Let, let's talk about that. What inspired that? Um, I mean, th- this concept of holding people accountable and like, we've all dealt with different things in our life from a overvaluing other people's opinions on things. Right. And one of the hardest lessons for most people to learn is the people that love you the most want you to be successful up to a point that they believe you deserve or are capable of. And when you go above that level, you piss some people off. And it, you're always going to piss off people that don't know you. This is, I think, a, another part of, like, building a personal brand and being online is, like, there's people in the fringes that think they're entitled to a full opinion. And if I don't react to it, I'm the asshole, right? Like, everybody's got a fucking opinion. And so anytime you build something of meaning, there's going to be people that take a 30-second clip of you. It's like, you know, the, the best compared analysis is, like, when you're in the grocery store yelling at your kids and someone wants to teach you how to parent, and they have no fucking clue what led to that and no fucking clue what you've done. I'm like, shut the fuck up. Like, I, I'm sorry. Apologize for my language. But I hate when people just, like take a 30 second snapshot and think they have all the context they need to give me advice right now. And so like, but that happens in business all the time. And like some people are going to have an opinion based on a really small snapshot of your story. And when you don't react, respond the way they want you to, they get pissed off at you as if they were entitled to your attention and input. But what really where I think most people struggle in business and in life is exceeding the people they love, the people that love them's expectations for them. Because then, well, you've changed. Oh, you're too good for us now. Oh, you don't. You can't come to the barbecue. You can't come to the wedding anymore. Like and this happened to me. This this is happening to me right now. We throw a client appreciation event every year on the first Friday of December. I got invited to a cousin's wedding who's on that, that Saturday. And I said, I can't come. And they're like, but we gave you like eight months notice. Can't you rearrange your schedule? No. Like, I'm sorry that like you as an employee can leave work and work doesn't stop. I don't have that luxury. In this specific event, it is the biggest event we throw every year. There's will be 150 people there. It's for all win rate clients and employees. I can't miss that. I'm sorry. And if you don't like, but the, like I got like my aunt's mad at me now. My, my cousin's mad at me. And I'm just like, I'll send a check. What do you want from me? Like, I can't be there. And like, that's an example of like, if I carry that as like, I'm some sort of bad person, which a lot of people do, 
I'm the bad person for not going and prioritizing this thing. You're going to, you're going to hate life because you're going to be doing that all the time. And by prioritizing things and reaching certain levels and becoming a certain version of yourself, like you're going to piss somebody off. If you carry that as you're the problem, you become the problem Mm -hmm. to yourself. Like you said, between the six inches in your head. And so like in business and in life and, and trying to accomplish something, when you are not giving up and like your track record shows I shouldn't be successful, but you are anyway. You remind people that they gave up. You remind people that they thought they weren't good enough, so you must not be good enough. You remind people that like, oh, like that version of you that they don't they don't know you changed, right? It's one of the biggest issues, I think, when you look at like your long-term friendships. They they don't change, but you do, but then somehow you're better than them. You're not, you're just out evolve them. Right. And like, that's what like the new people, like the the person who just met me today, the person on this live podcast that learned about me today is like, man, Mike really knows the shit. This dude's awesome. There's somebody I failed 20 years ago. That's like, Mike's a piece of shit. Mike shouldn't, Mike shouldn't be leading anybody. Well, bitch, I evolved. I changed. I'm sorry. You didn't, you weren't a part of every step of that journey, but that doesn't mean it didn't happen. And people cannot conceptualize that people who have not evolved cannot believe that you've evolved enough to deserve the thing that you have. So you must have lied, cheated, or steal to get it. And now they have to they have to punish you because no one else is going to. So I have to punish Mike because he doesn't deserve this. Shut off. I love that. I love that. And as when you were talking, I, I you know, I I I counted probably at least five relationships over the years where I don't speak to those people anymore because um whether it was envy or jealousy or, or something, or they felt like I, I didn't deserve what good things were happening. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's just funny how people's mindsets, it's like, they're the ones rooting you on when you're down here, you know what I mean? But then when you actually get up there, it's like, all of a sudden, it's kind of like, now you're the asshole because you can't uh, be at the barbecue, like you had mentioned or go on vacation. There was a, a, a couple that we used to hang out with all the time. And like something happened, like I felt like we were, we were growing at the same time together, but then all of a sudden something, something changed. And I don't think it was us. I mean, other than the fact that, that Jana and I, we kept growing and and, uh, we were doing the fearless 44 and stuff like that. And, and that really helped propel us. You know what I mean? That accountability of, of staying consistent, you know, daily and and setting goals. And we accomplished a lot in those, in those 44 days. And then we did another one. And then we did another one. You usually do one or two, two a year. And, and uh, it's like those self-improved things that, that improvements that, that we do, you know, people, I I don't know. I think a lot of it has to do with with envy and, and uh, you know, uh, of them watching you, succeed and and it's so crazy because you know i I try not to you know and and i might have been guilty of that a little bit too um especially when i was younger if somebody had a car or or something that you know i i couldn't i wouldn't be that guy like hey congratulations but but i think having lost everything um and and have found that that humility that that humbleness and and want to see people win like listen dude like if i'm riding first class my team's riding first class you know what i mean if i have to ride coach guess what we're yeah. we're we're all riding coach <laughs> you, For sure. you know what i mean and then that's yeah. that's where my my mindset is today i want to see everybody win exponentially you know we we talk about this all the time when, when people come into our organization and they're here for a while. They, 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 because we're, we're really big into self-improvement, you know, and, and, and growing as an individual. So when you come into our organization, you're, you're going to be different. You're going to change. You're going to be different. Your habits are going to change, whether it's the time you get up in the morning or, or how you treat other people um, and, and your work ethic, like these things change and, and, and core values. A lot of people don't even know what core values are. Okay. Or let alone a personal core value. But to have a business, have core values. And and let's say they they don't stay. Our retainage is pretty good. But let's say they do move on. I guarantee it that when they come through the organization and they leave, they're a different person. And the only thing that I can hope for is, is that they can go out, make $100 million and, in, and impact a billion people with what they have learned from coming through our organization of, of 
you know, and, and have that impact that might sting, that might burn. And I think that's the thing about legacy. You know, when you get to that level, it's like, there's a catch 22 with legacy. Unfortunately, we're not going to get the credit for half the things that we may have impacted somebody's life with. And now we don't even know half the people that might even watch this podcast today that may be impacted by listening to it. But, but you have to be okay with that. You, you have to want to do this to just want to be able to inspire people. And when you can have that influence on other people's lives and not really give two shits about taking the credit for, and we were talking about this conversation earlier today, you know, and and I think as the older I get and the more mature, and I think it really comes down to maturity, right? Like, and and humility, I can't speak enough on, on, on humility, you know, and, and finding your purpose in life, right? Like if, you know, I heard people say like, what is, what is my purpose in life? The, the purpose in a nutshell is, is that we're here to serve. And if it's anything outside of, of serving other people, then it's just selfishness, right? And, and I'd like to talk about, you know, legacy a good bit, you know, helping other people having an impact, you know, coming to realize, you know, we talked, talked about the money thing earlier, you know, money is only like, like the vehicle that has given us the ability to do these things, you know, being an entrepreneur, it has to be more than the money, right? The ones that keep fighting are, are, are driven by something much more than money. We go through way entirely too much bullshit. The, you know what I mean? It, it's, it. we got to get clear on our purpose. We have to be honest with ourselves. We have to be, you know, it's, oh, that's, it's a whole, that's a whole nother podcast episode. Man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah I'm Legacy sorry. and purpose. It's a whole nother episode. Yeah. I hate to cut this short, but we're a little past the hour and I need to get going to my next. Oh, meeting. cool. I can't um, even see half the shit that we're yeah, doing. No right problem. Now, so thank yeah, you. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me on, man. That was awesome. And yeah, uh, thank you for, for, for coming on and, and, and putting it. up with my, uh, my airheadedness <laughs> today. No, nah, man, it's all good. Look, enjoy the rest of your trip. Hopefully you, you'll, you'll continue to make the impact there that you hope to. And uh, looking forward to seeing you at the next one, man. Thank you, brother. All right. Well, you guys have a good day. Thank you for watching. Make sure you tune in next week for episode 222. Don't forget to like, love, and subscribe to our Spotify, our YouTube, and our Apple channel. Talk to you guys next week for episode 222.